Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to the Microsoft Outlook 2021 video course. Outlook is the email calendaring application used worldwide. This course is for anyone looking to learn about all the really cool features Outlook has to offer from beginning to end. In this module, you'll learn how to group, sort, filter, and search for messages, how to modify Outlook settings, create automated replies, and create rules to simplify repetitive tasks. In the final module, you'll learn how to work with multiple calendars, import and export contacts, share and delegate access to other users, create and assign tasks, and last but not least, how to back up your Outlook items. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our off-site community. The link is in the description as well. As always, if this course has exercise files, you'll find them in the video description below. Now it's time for us to move on to the advanced portion of Outlook 2021. And this also consists of two modules. Module three is automating Outlook and module four is advanced Outlook settings. Let's take a deeper look at module three. This module will cover more advanced settings within Outlook. We'll also talk about the search functionality and automating repetitive tasks. We have a few learning outcomes for this module. At the end of it, you should be able to group, sort, filter, and search for messages. You should also be able to modify settings within Outlook, create automated replies, and create rules to simplify repetitive tasks. And we'll get there by covering these lessons. In the first lesson, you'll learn about modifying messages and setting global options. Lesson two is organizing, searching, and managing messages. Lesson three is more on managing your mailbox. And lesson four is automating message management. In the first lesson, you'll learn how to insert advanced characters and objects, how to modify message settings and options, how to configure global Outlook options, and also how to customize the Outlook interface. Let's go ahead and bring up a new email message. And we'll use this email to learn about how to insert advanced characters and objects. So you can address it to yourself or to another email address if you like. I'm gonna address it to myself and another email address. And we're gonna use poll as in P-O-L-L, poll, as a subject line. And actually we'll do poll dash advanced characters. You wanna be in the body of the email. So the first thing we're gonna type is, this is a poll powered by Microsoft Forms. And then you're gonna put your insertion point right after Microsoft before the space. You're gonna go to the insert tab of the ribbon and over to the right, you have a symbols group. We're gonna do the drop down arrow for symbol and we're gonna just go to more symbols. Now I'll tell you that at the top you have a symbols tab which you're on you also have a special characters tab. And you will see in a moment how some of the symbols are also considered special characters. So I want us all to use the same symbol. If you look over here, I'm in a subset called Latin-1 supplement. I'd like you to do that drop down and select the same subset that I'm in. In that subset, you'll see that I already have it selected, the registered trademark symbol. Once you find it and select it in the lower right corner, you're gonna click on insert. And you can see it in the body of the email, it inserted it already. Now go to the special characters tab 
and you'll see some other special characters, but you'll also see that register trademark symbol. This tab will give you the shortcut key that you can use whenever you need to insert that symbol, Alt Control R. We're gonna go ahead and close the symbol dialog box. Click at the end of the word form and press enter. Also in that symbols group, and this comes in handy sometimes, you have the horizontal line. Go ahead and click it and then click it again. So you inserted two horizontal lines underneath that just to kind of make a difference between the upper half and the lower half, something like that. Now also on the insert tab in the include group, the third icon is poll. And if you hover over it, it says create an instant real time poll. You're going to click it and it opens up the polls pane on the right side of your email message on the polls pane. You'll notice in the upper right hand corner, even though we haven't done anything in the poll, it has a counter of characters, 83 dash 330. So 330 total characters, but 83 of them are already reserved for overhead without us even typing anything. We're going to click where it says input your question and we're going to type, did you enjoy the outlook introductory video course question mark. Click where it says option one, and that's going to be yes. Option two is no. And we're going to add an option. And this is going to be no opinion. Now notice as you hover over your options, you can delete them if necessary. We're going to scroll down and we'll see that you can allow for multiple answers. We're not going to do this with our poll. We're going to click next at the bottom. So this is what the respondent would see. Your email address will be sent with your response. Did you enjoy it? It shows the question and answer, vote, view results. We're going to click add to email here. And so you'll see it and notice it lets you know that the poll card has been added. And it tells you, don't worry about seeing just a link in the email. Recipients will be able to vote directly in email or on the web. Now I'm going to go ahead and close that polls panel by using the X in the upper right hand corner. And it got rid of, this is a poll powered by my, well, no, it, there it is. This is a poll powered by Microsoft Forms. So I still see it. It's there. I'm going to select that text and cut it by using control X. And then I'm going to press home to get to the beginning of that line, press enter up arrow, and then control V to paste that line. So I wasn't in the right space when I said that when we put in the poll, but it doesn't really matter. I can select the poll as well and put that underneath. I'm going to cut it control X and click underneath the horizontal lines. So that's kind of how we had it originally. I just didn't have us in the right place when we inserted the poll. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and click send. So I've gone to my other email and you can see I have the email poll advanced characters and I already selected it so I can see it in my reading pane. Did I enjoy the Outlook introductory video course? For this one, I'm going to go ahead and say yes. And then I'm going to click on the vote button. So it automatically shows results, right? Yes, I got one vote. And then I'm going to go to my other email. And this one, I'm going to say no opinion and vote. And so now you see it's here. So if I keep this email open, I sent it right. And I can keep refreshing it here as other people. If I sent it to a bunch of people 
As they respond, I can always look at it and refresh and see the results. Now, the one other thing I'll say about the form and Outlook, the poll form, is that anybody who takes the poll can also view the results. So if you click on view results, you'll see the results that have been submitted so far. You're not seeing who submitted the results, but you will be able to, all the respondents will be able to see the results of the poll. Okay, our next topic is going to be modifying message settings and options. Let's go ahead and bring up a new email. And I've actually gone to the following week here. So you're seeing my inbox is collapsed, but it's saying last week. So we're going to just do a new email message. And I'm going to address it to my other email address. And if you have another email address, do so as well. Or you can address it to yourself. The subject for this one is going to be message settings and options. I'm going to type a quick sentence here. We are going to learn about settings and options at the message level. In the next topic, we will learn about global outlook options. So now what we want to do is let's go to the options tab on the new message window. And on the options tab, just to show you, if you wanted to do a blind carbon copy, uh, BCC is you send an email to me and you BCC your boss. I do not know that you also copied your boss on that email. So if you want to do a BCC, the field doesn't show up automatically. You have to click BCC in show fields, and then you get a BCC line. And if you click on BCC again on the ribbon, the BCC line will disappear. Now there's a tracking group and we used this earlier when we requested a delivery and a read receipt. There's also something in there called voting, use voting buttons, but there's even more in that tracking group. To open the entire group, you're going to click on that little diagonal arrow in the lower right hand corner of the group. Here, I'll point to it for you. And if you click on that, it will open all of the options, those options that are on the ribbon, as well as some other ones in this property dialog box. So if you, and some of these things you can do from the ribbon and different tabs on the ribbon, but they're all kind of put together in this dialog box. So let's say we wanted to mark this message important. By default, the importance is normal. Your choices are low, normal, and high. Choose high on this one. So on this message, you're marking it with high importance and use that sparingly. Don't mark every message that you send with high importance. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf after a while. And then you have a sensitivity setting, which is also defaulting to normal. And we're going to say, let's mark this one confidential. And you'll see how this shows up when your recipient gets the email. Now, we have polls now available, and you just saw that in the last topic, but there's also voting buttons that you can use in Outlook. So let's check use voting buttons, and you notice that it gives you three defaults, approve, reject, Yes, no, yes, no, maybe. You can also just type over those and make your own options. We'll leave this one on approve, reject. And this again is to show you how these things show up in the actual email. We already learned about the delivery and read receipt, so we'll skip those. Now under delivery options, 
let's say that you're sending this email and you're leaving tomorrow for a vacation. You can have the replies to this email sent to someone else in your organization, your department, a colleague, maybe your manager. So you can set that up in here as well. We're not going to do that. Now, let's say that you're going on vacation tomorrow and you're sending this email today, but you don't want it delivered until Tuesday. So you can say, do not deliver before and pick a date and a time. Now you can also expire or email an email after a certain date and time. Why would you want to expire an email? Say you're sending out a group email and you're trying to decide where to have the annual staff get together. Well, once you receive your responses, maybe you'll use a poll for that, right? Give them some choices. Once you get all of your responses and as the date of the event is occurring, you no longer want those emails to be still sitting out there. So if you, an exp if you expire an email in the recipient's inbox on the date and time that you set for it to be expired, it will be crossed out with a red line in their inbox. It doesn't remove it from their inbox. They can still reply to it. But the training here is that if you get an email in your inbox and it's crossed out and dimmed out, just ignore it. It has expired. And it's automatically saving copies of sent messages. You can also categorize your messages if you'd like, this message in particular, rather. We're gonna go ahead and close. So if you look at the top above your send, it says you added voting buttons to this message. I have another thing that pops up because I'm actually recording this on a weekend. So it's asking me if I want to send it during work hours. So it just lets you know that you added voting buttons to the message up here. Go ahead and click on send. So now I've switched to my other email so you can see how this message appears in my inbox. Because we marked it with high importance, it has the red exclamation point on the right side of the message header. So that happens automatically. Now, if we had done low importance, I think it's like a blue arrow or something. So we have that exclamation point, meaning this is important. It should get your attention. When I click on the message and I look at it in the reading pane, it says this message includes voting buttons. Click here to vote. It also says, please treat this as confidential because we also marked it as confidential. It also lets you know that this message was sent with high importance which is indicated by the red exclamation point in the inbox. So if I want to vote, I can click here to vote right in that band. And it gives me my two choices, approve or reject. I'm going to just be ornery and I'm going to reject this. And it says you have chosen to respond, reject, send the response now. Now, if I edit the response before sending, I can send a little note with it, but I'm going to just click OK and send the response now. It lets me know the date and time that I responded. So the email that I sent that message from will get the response in the inbox as you're seeing here. So Trish Connor Cato rejected message settings and options, which was the subject line, right? So I can see that response in my inbox. Now, the thing is, let's say I sent that vo voting buttons message to 25 people and they're responding on different dates and times. I don't want to have to keep looking through my inbox for the responses. So what you would do is you would go to your sent items folder, the email address that you sent the voting buttons email from. And in your sent items, you're going to open that email. So I'm going to double click on it. 
And when I open it, if I go to the message tab on the ribbon in the show group, I can click on tracking. And when I track it, it will have just a list of all the people who responded, what their response was, the date and time that they responded. At the top, it will have a summary. The time the message was sent, the total amount of replies, and what the total amount of responses. So I don't have to look through my emails, my inbox, to see all the individual responses. I can go to the sent item, turn on tracking on the message tab of the ribbon, and get my cumulative responses that way. I'm going to go ahead and close this message and go back to my inbox. So now we're going to move on to configuring global outlook options. And to do that, we're going to go to the file tab on the ribbon and all the way at the, almost at the bottom of the blue band on the left, you're going to click on options and you get the outlook options dialog box. Notice the different categories on the left. When you go in, you're on the general tab. So some of these, it's like your username, your initials. If you want to give it a background, an office background or an office theme, the themes carry over to all of your office programs. So if you choose a dark gray theme here, it will be dark gray and Excel, Word, etc. You have some startup options. Well, there's no startup options here, but you have attachment options. If you're attaching files from OneDrive or SharePoint, it's by default going to ask you how you want to attach them every time, or you could always share them as links or always attach them as copies. On the left side, if you click on mail, we'll go over some mail options. So this option right here, always check spelling before sending is why when you click on send, it will automatically perform spell check. And it also will ignore the original message text in a reply or a forward. So when you reply or forward to a message and you'll see this play out, if there's a typo in the original message, it will ignore that when it's doing spell check. That's what that second check mark does. Let's go ahead and click on the signatures button on the right side under create or modify signatures for messages. So this is where you can set up your email signature that will automatically show at the bottom of every email that you send. So because I have multiple accounts in here, I'm making sure that I'm on the correct email account over here. And then I am going to click on the new button and type a name for my signature. And I'm going to just call it default. You can have multiple signatures for multiple email addresses. So down here in the edit signature portion of the screen, I'm going to just type my name and I will put my email address there. Normally you would have your job title, maybe your phone number, that kind of thing. So I'm going to just keep it simple here. There's also templates that are available to you if you want to get signature templates, but I'm going to just leave this signature very simple. I can select all the text and change the font, the font size, do all of that kind of stuff with it. What I'm going to do is save it. And then notice under my email account on the right side, it says new messages are going to use the default signature. Now, I don't necessarily want a signature on my replies or forwards. So I will leave that set to none. And at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. So we'll see this when we get back into our email. I do want to go over some more global options for you. Right underneath your signatures, you could make your messages look more stylized by using stationary, if you will, on them. So click on stationary and fonts. 
And when you get in here, you're on the personal stationary tab. This is another way you can get back to your email signature. They're both share a tab here. So in the personal stationary tab, I'm going to click on theme and it opens up stationaries and themes. So a theme will show you a sample. I clicked on the theme afternoon. It will show you a heading style. If you have bullets in your email, the way they are configured, it would be a horizontal line and then heading style two, so on and so forth. Stationary actually is like the background of your email. So these are mixed in themes and stationaries. Stationaries have stationary after it in parentheses. So you can look at some of the stationaries. These get a little bit of play. I personally don't use these in my business emails. It's just a personal choice. I'll leave it like that. So you can go through and find a stationary that you can live with for the next few moments. I'm going to just use the tech tool stationary and click OK. And then and this is where you can change your fonts for your new mail messages, replying or forwarding messages, so on and so forth. We're going to just click OK at the bottom. And then we saw this earlier from the View tab, right? But if you click on Reading Pane here, we talked about this. If you don't want the item to be marked as red when the selection changes, you can uncheck that box. I'm actually used to it, so I'm going to leave mine checked. You can also say mark items as read when viewed in the reading pane. You can wait however many seconds before marking the item as read. So I'm going to just leave mine on mark item as read when selection changes. And I'm going to click OK. You can go down and see that you can have it play a sound or change your mouse pointer or show an envelope in the taskbar or display a desktop alert when a new message arrives. And you have some information in here. I'm not going to go over all of these options with you, but I would suggest you go to file options and get familiar with them because this is how you can customize Outlook for yourself. So if you're replying and forwarding to a message, maybe you want your replies and forwards in a new window, stuff like that. It automatically saves items that have not been sent after, in my case, three minutes. You can change that time frame. So if I'm in the middle of typing an email and I don't finish it and I get distracted and start doing other stuff, it will automatically save it after three minutes to my drafts folder. Now, some of these we saw on message options, right? The default importance level is normal as opposed to high or low. Sensitivity level is normal as opposed to personal, private, or confidential. This is where you can change those settings globally. You can mark your messages as expired after this many days. We talked about expiring a message, right? So a lot of these you can do on a message basis or you can do it globally. I'm going to just show you a couple of calendar options. So on the left, go to calendar. If your work hours are different than eight to five, Monday through Friday, you can change them here. It will reflect on your calendar. If you want to change your default duration for new appointments and meetings, you can change it here. And you can add holidays to your calendar. If you click on add holidays, it automatically defaults to United States. And you only want to do this one time. If you add your United States holidays to your calendar and then you come back in here and do it again, each holiday will be on your calendar twice. So we're going to click OK on that and we'll check all of this out in just a bit. So the holidays were added to your calendar. You're going to click OK. And you can change your calendar color and all of that stuff. Now, when we were in the calendar earlier, I showed you that I had two different time zones. So if you under time zones, if you check the box that says show a second time zone, that's how that happens. So I like to have the East Coast and California on my calendar. 
And what you don't want to do, this is a little tricky wicket. If you swap time zones, it's going to change the time on your computer to whatever your second time zone is. I learned that the hard way years ago. So just want to get you comfortable with coming to Outlook options, checking them out, changing what you want. There's options for tasks over here where you can get a default reminder time. There are advanced options. And some of this you can do from the view tab. So customizing your Outlook panes, show you more ways to customize some stuff. At the bottom, we're gonna just click OK to get out of there. So let's bring up a new email. And you'll see whatever stationery you chose. And I think mine looks horrible. I'm going to go back to file options and get rid of it. Um, but the stationery shows as well as your signature. Now, let's say you had multiple signatures for your email address. Right on the message tab, you can get to your signature. You can see it is showing the default one. Or you could go into signatures from there, right? And if you had another one, it would be in this list and you could select it to show in this email. Now, since I'm in here, I'm actually gonna go to the personal stationary tab and I'm gonna go to theme and I'm gonna scroll all the way to the top and I'm gonna choose no theme and click okay and okay. Now it's not going to change it in this message, right? So it got rid of the stationary, but since I had this message already open, it's not going to delete it. I'm going to go ahead and close this message and bring up another new email. And now you can see going forward, I won't have the stationary, but I already have my email signature. So I want to do something with this email that will circle back around to in a little while in our next topic. So I'm gonna address this email to my other self and I'm gonna give it a subject of conversation. And I'm gonna click in the body of the message and it puts the insertion point above my signature. And I'm gonna just type, this is the start of an email conversation. And I'm gonna go ahead and send this email. Now, before we move to the next topic, at the bottom of your folders pane, go ahead and click on your calendar icon. I wanna just point out a couple of calendar options from file options in here. So I'm on work week view and on the mini calendar for September on the left, I'm going to click on the fifth. And because we added the holidays, you'll see Labor Day United States on Monday the fifth and it's on the calendar as an event above any of the appointment lines. The other thing I want to point out, if you just keep your eye on my California time zone, right? you'll notice that the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. are unshaded on the calendar. Those are the working hours that I have in file options for the calendar. So those are unshaded. Everything outside of that time frame is shaded on the calendar. And we can go back to the inbox. So I'm in the email that I sent the conversation email to, and I'm just gonna select that email over here. By the way, it's very rare that I double click an email to open it. I normally just handle it in the reading pane to my right, because in there I can do everything or from the ribbon, I can reply. If the email was to multiple people, I could reply to all of them. I could forward the email to someone. I could schedule a meeting based off of the email, so on and so forth. There's more actions. I can forward the email as an attachment as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reply and I'm gonna just type, sounds good. And send it. 
And now I'll tell you why we're doing this. So part of this topic is customizing the Outlook interface. And we did some customizations earlier from the view tab, but I'm going to show you some more. So now I'm going to go back to my other inbox, the one that I sent it from. And here's my reply. Sounds good, right? And I'm going to reply to this. And I'm going to just say, fantastic. Thank you. Now I'm having a conversation back and forth via email with this person. And I'm going to go ahead and send. I don't want to have to look through my inbox to find the whole conversation, right? So there's a setting that we're going to change and you'll see how this works. I'm going to go up to the view tab. And on the view tab in the messages group, I'm going to click on show as conversations. And it gives me the option to show messages arranged by conversations in this folder, meaning this inbox or in all my mailboxes. I'm going to choose this folder. And when I click on that conversation email, you'll notice it has an expand arrow in front of the person's name, my other, well, my name, I'm going to click that arrow. And now you're seeing the entire conversation as if it's all in one thing. So I don't have to go to the individual emails. I can see everything right there in the conversation back and forth. It's just a nice feature. Now also on the view tab in that messages group, you have conversation settings right? Um, where you can show messages from other folders or above the subject. I'm going to uncheck show messages from other folders because it was showing my sent items as well. And I can always expand the selected conversation. So I don't have to use that expand arrow if I want that to be a setting. So that's kind of how that works. Okay. The second button on the view tab is view settings, right? And if you want to, so let me cancel out of here for a minute and just expand my today. And so I just have who it's from. I have the subject line. I have the date, so on and so forth, right? I'm, I'm actually going to get rid of my show as conversations for right now. Go back to my inbox. Okay. So I may want to change what's showing and how it's showing. So that's where you use view settings, right? And I can say what columns I want to see in my inbox. So if I click on columns, right, it shows the columns that are currently showing in my inbox. And on the left side, there are other columns that could be used if you wanted a CC column over there, for example, you can click on it and then add. That's kind of how that works. I'm going to cancel out of there. We went into group by earlier, and that's where I showed you how I can expand or collapse all of my groups in the inbox and mine are all collapsed. We did that on the bottom right. And I'm going to cancel out of there. So by default, it's sorted, your email is sorted by the received date in descending order. So the most recent email at the top, you could change the sort order and you're going to learn how to sort messages and filter them in just in the next lesson. But this is where you go for all of this, right? We're going to go ahead and cancel out of there. Oh, by the way, and you don't have to go back into view settings, I will. If you play around in here and you get your settings so that you're just like, oh my goodness, I want to undo everything. You can always at the bottom reset your current view. I think that's important to know. You can reset your view from up here on the ribbon as well. Now the first button on the ribbon is change view, right? So by default, it's in a view called compact. You have a single view right? And you see the little bit of a difference there. And you also have preview view and preview view gets rid of the reading pane. 
So those are three built-in views. I'm gonna just take mine back to compact. So as mentioned, we're gonna use some more of those view settings in our next lesson. So our second lesson here is organizing, searching, and managing messages. So some of this we're gonna be doing from those view settings by grouping and sorting messages. You're also gonna learn how to filter and manage messages and how to search your Outlook items in this lesson. So now I'm gonna expand my last week folder because I have more in there. I'm gonna expand my last week folder in my inbox and back on the view tab, I'm gonna go to view settings again. And this time we're gonna go to group by, not just so we can expand or collapse our inbox groups, but so we can actually group items. So uncheck at the top, automatically group according to arrangement. And where it says group items by none, we're gonna do the drop down, and we're gonna scroll down until we see from and click on from. And then by, we're gonna do the drop down next to none. And we're gonna choose received. And we're gonna leave the from in ascending order and received in descending order. And we're gonna click okay. And then okay again. So now you'll see all of my emails are grouped by from and then by date, right? Who it's from and then the dates of the emails. Now, some people like that arrangement. It's not my choice, but just so you know that you can group. We group by from and then the received date. And I'm gonna right click on the top one and collapse all groups. And then I'm gonna click on that reset view button and choose yes. And now it's back to the way it was before. So that comes in handy. I didn't have to go back into view settings. I'm just gonna collapse all of my groups again. Let's go back to view settings. And notice now group by says none since we reset the view. Let's go to the sort button in view settings. So by default, it's sorting the items by the received date in descending order. Well, where it says received, do the drop down and scroll through and choose from, and then click okay, and okay again. So similar to when we grouped, except that you're actually just seeing the from and it's not showing the dates underneath, right? So I'm gonna go back to collapse all groups. I'm gonna go to view settings this time and go back to sort. Now I could have reset the view and I'm gonna change the from back to received and then it automatically goes to descending and click okay and okay again. So when I reset my view, it got rid of my collapsed groupings in my inbox. So I've been manually collapsing them again. I'm gonna go back to view settings, group by, and in the bottom right corner, I'm gonna choose all collapsed again. And okay, and okay. So now we're gonna go back to view settings because that's also where you go. And if you notice the filter is set to off, by default there is no filtering set on your inbox. So we're gonna click on the filter button and you can search for the words, right? On the message tab there, search for the words in the subject field only or search 
who it's from, who it was sent to, or where you are the only person in the two line. If I, if I check where I am and then do the drop down or on the two line with other people or on the CC line with other people, those are your choices. And then you have a time box there, right? When it was received, if I choose receive down there, and I'll say in the last seven days. And then I put in my from my other self, right? So this is filtering messages from this email or this person received in the last seven days. And I'm going to click OK and then OK. So now it's showing any from today sent from that person and the last seven days sent from that person. So I do have a filter applied. Now I want to show you where you can tell whether or not you have a filter applied in your mailbox. If you look all the way down at your status bar, the gray band all the way at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that it says filter applied. And that's because if I right click in my status bar, notice I have the check mark in front of filter. So I have that turned on so it will show up there when I have a filter applied. Good visual cue. I'm going to go back to view settings and I'm going to go to filter and I'm going to choose clear all in the bottom right corner and click OK. And I'm going to click OK again and the filter is off. Now in terms of searching your email, you don't use view settings for that. You can use the search box at the upper right hand corner, right? So you can search for more than just emails in here, by the way, right? It actually gives you actions like how to turn off your reading pane, change your profile, how many lines do you want in your message preview kind of thing. So in the search box, I'm going to type message settings and press enter. And notice my results, right? Come back today. So it's showing anything that has message settings in the subject line, in the body of the message, it's looking at those as two separate words, right? And it highlights them in yellow, anywhere where it's seeing message and or settings. And it's showing all the emails in the selected two words are highlighted in yellow. Pretty cool. Now, when you do a search, you also get a search tab on the ribbon and it's searching the current mailbox by default. If you want to clear the search up at the search box all the way to its right, you're going to click the X and it gets rid of the search. Let's click in the search box again. And once you click in that search box, the search tab shows up on the ribbon on the search tab. In the refine group, you're going to click on has attachments. So now my results are showing emails with attachments attached, All right? Pretty cool. Now I can use the refine group. I could say it's from a certain person with a certain subject has attachments. I can search for messages that are categorized. Right. I just clicked on has attachments to get out of there. Let me go back to the search tab of the ribbon One second, and click back on that. So has attachments. Yeah. So you'll notice up in the search, the phrase says has attachments colon. Yes, because we clicked that button. So it's showing those in the results. Now, if I click the X that clears that search, I can go back into the search box, 
back to the search tab and click on categorize and click on illustrations. And we'll see the results where we categorized and we changed that blue category to illustrations in the introductory part of this course. Search is pretty cool. Now, just to go over some more things, so you can search by just typing what you're looking for in the search box. You can use the search tab on the ribbon. You can search for flag mail, mail that's been marked important. There's more, items expiring soon, and you can add some fields there. You can also find your recent searches here. So category equals illustration, has attachments equal yes, right? I had some other stuff on that list as well. So the search functionality is really cool. Now, when you're searching, you're searching in the current mailbox. I'm gonna show you another type of search, right? So in the search box, I'm gonna type SharePoint and then I'm going to choose in the scope on that search tab of the ribbon, I'm going to choose all outlook items. So it's showing me my results. Now, if you look at my, I'm just going to collapse all of these groups, right? I have results in my calendar. I have results in my inbox. These are different folders that I have. Learn it, Microsoft Netherlands. I have it in my sent folder and sent items, right? So it's showing me everywhere that it's finding SharePoint. So if I look at my calendar, I see my SharePoint consultations, right? Which show up on my calendar. So I'm gonna do the X to the right of the search box and clear that search. So our next topic here, or actually our next lesson is how to use junk email. How does the whole thing work? Well, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for when something ends up in your junk email box, right? Sometimes, I receive mails from certain people all the time and very occasionally one of their emails will end up in my junk email. Usually know it when someone says, hey, did you receive my email? And you're like, no. And they're like, hey, check your junk email. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to force this to happen here. I just have this other email that I get, a daily briefing. You can really drag any email that's in your inbox. We're going to drag it. I'm going to drag this email onto my junk email folder. And I'm just going to say, okay, I want to continue. So you'll know you have items in your junk email when your junk email is bold and it has a number or numbers next to it, right? Indicating you have junk email. So let's say you get an email in your inbox and you want to make it junk. Now, I don't want to make this junk. It's kind of hard to force something to come up automatically that really would be junk right now during this video course. So I'm going to make believe this is junk. Now, I'm going to right click on that email in my junk email and I'm going to hover over junk. And it says block sender. Never block the sender, never block the sender's domain, never block this group or mailing list. Then it says not junk. If it's not junk, you won't want to click that option. So let's do that option first. I'm going to say it's not junk and it will let me know that the message will be moved back into the inbox folder. So I click OK. And then it's just back in my inbox. Now I'm going to go back to my inbox and find it again and drag it back to junk email so I can show you the other options. So back in my junk email folder, I'm going to right click on the message, hover over junk, and I'm going to go to the bottom and select junk email options. Okay. So 
I'm going to go, let's make believe in this example that this is junk email. I'm going to go to block senders and I'm going to choose add on the right, right? So this email comes from this email address, viva no reply at microsoft.com. I could put that in, but I probably want everything from that particular domain to be considered junk. Now I'm just doing this as an example. I'm going to have to undo this. So instead of typing the email address, I'm going to type at microsoft.com. So I'm going to click OK on this. And so any emails that come into my mailbox from that domain will automatically be sent to my junk email. Now, I really don't want that to happen. But that's the way, because you notice when you get junk email, especially if it's scam mail and everything, it'll be Sam at whatever domain. And then you send that to junk. And two days later, you get one from Peggy at that same domain. So you could block the entire domain or the email. Now, I'm going to just remove this. You also have a safe senders list. So it put this on my safe senders list. The other thing, also trust email from my contacts. If I have people in my contacts list, I don't want them to go to my junk email. So you can go here and make sure that doesn't happen. And then you can also add, automatically add people I email to your safe senders list. So those people don't get blocked either. And we're going to go ahead and click OK at the bottom. So I'm going to move this email. I'm going to right click on it again, hover over junk and say not junk. So it sends it back to my inbox for me. But that's how you handle your junk email. And you, you might want to just kind of look at it like every day or so just to see, make sure you're not missing anything and you can adjust and put people on the safe recipients list and so on and so forth. And I'm going to go back to my inbox. So managing your junk email was our third lesson. I just didn't bring the slide up for it. Now we're going to do the fourth and final lesson in this module before moving into our next module. And this is automating message management. So we're going to learn how to use automatic replies how to use the rules wizard to organize messages and how to create and use quick steps. This is really all super cool features that I get excited about. So now we're going to set it up so that we will have automatic replies in response to emails coming into our inbox. To do so, we're going to go to the file tab of the ribbon to go backstage. And right there on the info tab, you'll see automatic replies. We're going to click the button. So these are not just used for when you're going to be out of the office. It could be away from your desk. You could be in a meeting for two hours. You could be going to vacation. You just want any incoming senders to get an automatic response, whatever the reason may be. So by default, automatic replies are not on. We're going to enable them by doing the option button in front of send automatic replies. And then once you enable it, you can tell it to only send during this time range. So we're going to make believe we're getting ready to take a two week vacation. So I'm going to start mine. I'm going to just change the start time to 1030 p.m just so I can demonstrate it during this course, the way it's going to work. And I'm going to say that I'm going to be returning to work on August 22nd in my case, and I'll make that 8 a.m. So on the bottom half, you have two tabs, inside and outside your organization. If someone whether they're inside or outside of my organization, 
sends me an email during this time frame, they're going to get one automatic reply from my account. If they subsequently send me another email, they will not get another automatic reply. And it says that here, it will automatically reply once for each sender with the following message. So on the bottom half of the screen, you're going to click underneath the type of font. And this is the inside my organization. I'm going to just type, I will be on vacation until 8.22. Contact Jenny A if you need anything. And then I'm going to switch to the outside my organization tab. Now, if I only want to send an automatic reply to people inside my organization, I can disable it for people outside my organization by unchecking auto reply checkbox here. If I do want a message to go out for people sending from outside my organization, I can choose to have it only go to my people in my contact list or anyone outside my organization, which is the default. This one I'm gonna make a little more formal. I'm gonna type, thanks for your email. I will be away from the office until August 22nd. If you need anything, please contact, and I'm just gonna put in Jenny Alvarado at Jenny, and I'm just gonna give her an email address. Or you can call her at, make believe phone number coming up, something like that. And then I simply click OK. So now right here, it lets me know that auto replies are being sent from this account. I'm going to do the back arrow at the top of the blue band to get back to my mailbox. Right underneath my ribbon, it also lets me know that automatic replies are being sent for this account and I could turn them off from there as well. So I'm gonna go to my other email address, my other mailbox, and I'm gonna send myself an email. So when I address the email from my other account, it lets me know that training has an automatic reply going and that training is not available. Now at this point, I can say both of my email accounts are both within my organization. So that would show up anybody that's using Outlook. But anyway, at this point I could decide, well, she's not around, I won't send the email, or I will go ahead and send the email. So the subject for this one is going to be, we'll just call it automatic reply. And I'll just type, hey Trish, let, let's get together when you are available. And then I'm going to go ahead and send it. So now you see I get the automatic reply. This is from my sending email. And it gives the within my organization message that I wrote. And when I switch back to my training mailbox, I get the email that came in while I'm on vacation. Now I'm going to turn off automatic replies. And I'm going to do it right underneath the ribbon, the yellow band. So earlier in the introductory part of this course, we learned how to create subfolders underneath our inbox folder. That's when we created a manager folder and a training folder. And after we created those folders, we went in to our inbox 
and we manually selected and dragged some emails from our inbox to those folders. Well, you can automate that process in Outlook by using rules. So we're gonna end up creating two rules. I wanna show you two different ways of creating rules. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that the emails that I sent myself, which would be from Trish Connor Cato from my other email, I'm gonna have those automatically go to the manager folder as soon as they come into my mailbox. Now, if you have an email selected, like I do now, from the person that you want to create the rule about, you can do it in the way that I'm gonna show you first. So with any email that you sent to yourself from another email, if you don't have another email and you've been sending to yourself, just select one of those. And we're gonna create a rule that will make sure that any emails from Trish Connor Cato, in my case, will go to the manager folder automatically. And when we create this rule, it will take any emails that are currently in my inbox and move them to the manager folder also. So on the home tab of the ribbon, in the move group, you're gonna click on the rules dropdown. And when you have an email selected, you will have the first and second choices available to you on this list. So the first choice is the easiest. It says always move messages from Trish Connor Cato, in my case. When I click on that, it brings me a choose a folder screen. You can expand your inbox if necessary and click on the manager folder and then click OK. So it took a moment, but you notice I don't have a today group in my inbox now because all of the emails from today have been, well, when I've been doing this portion of the recording, have been from Trish Connor Cato. So now when I go to my manager folder, all of the emails from Trish Connor Cato are in there all of the ones that were in my inbox and any subsequent ones will go in here automatically. Now, when we manually moved emails from the inbox to the folder earlier in the course, I dragged some other emails in other than from Trish Connor Cato and that's fine. So now I'm going to go back to my inbox. Now this time I don't want to have any emails selected. I'm gonna go back to the rules drop down, and my only choice without having an email selected is manage rules and alerts. And so this is creating a rule from scratch. We're gonna click on manage rules and alerts. And so you have email rules tab at the top and a manage alerts tab. So we're focusing on the rules right now. So apply changes to this folder. In this folder, we already have one rule, right? And that's the rule we created while we had the email selected. And if you notice that rule is checked and at the bottom, it gives a description, apply this rule after the message arrives from Trish Connor Cato, move it to the manager folder and stop processing more rules. That's what it's doing. And we're gonna test both of these in a moment, the existing rule and the one that we're getting ready to create. So what I wanna do is I wanna click on the new rule button. And now you get to start from a template or from a blank rule. Step one, select a template. So they have templates categorized, stay organized, stay up to date, start from a blank rule. The top choice under stay organized is move messages from someone to a folder. And that's the choice that we're gonna use here. Step two is edit the rule description and it tells you to click an underlined value. Apply this rule after the message arrives from and that people or public group is a link. So you can go ahead and click that. 
So I can select my training one here, my training email. I just have a blocker covering some phone information. And I'm gonna just double click on training, click OK. So now it says at the bottom, apply this rule after the message arrives from training and then move it to the specified folder. I'm gonna click on specified and I'm gonna select my training folder under the inbox and click okay. Now down at the bottom, it has a next button. When you do it from scratch, you get to select conditions. So it's from people or a public group, it's from training, right? And we can have with specified words in the subject. So if the subject says meeting, maybe somewhere in the subject line, maybe move it to a meeting folder or something like that. So if I get an email from training and it's marked as important, that can be moved to a folder. So you see all of these choices you have here and there's a long list, but wait, there's more. Those are your conditions. I'm not selecting any other than the default one. And we're gonna go next at the bottom. Now, what do you wanna do with the message? So it's gonna stop processing more rules, move it to the specified folder. I can also assign it to a category, delete it, which moves it to my deleted items folder, permanently delete it, it will permanently delete it. I can make a copy of it and have that move to a folder. I can forward it, I can flag it, print it, play a sound, all kinds of things. And there is another next button at the bottom. You can have exceptions to your rules. So any message that I receive from training is gonna get moved to the training folder, except if the subject contains the specific word of kangaroo, because I might have a kangaroo folder for that. So these are exceptions to the rule. You can do next at the bottom again. You can specify a name for this rule. I'm gonna leave it called training. Now, when you do it this way, it turns on the rule but it won't run it on messages already in the inbox unless you do this checkbox. So we're gonna check that. I'm not gonna create this rule on all of my accounts. And I'm gonna do finish at the bottom. Now on my rules and alert screen, I have both of my rules listed. I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. So send an email to whatever email address you use for the training folder, and it should go directly into that folder. You can also send an email from the email that you use for manager and have it go in there. And I'll have you do that on your own. And if you have access to your other email, you'll have a one next to your manager folder and a one next to your training folder because the emails are automatically being routed to those folders via the rule. Now there may be times that you want to disable rules so I'm gonna go back to rules. I wanna disable my rules for the rest of this class. And I'm gonna go to manage rules and alerts. And I'm simply going to uncheck the rules. And I'm gonna click apply. And then okay. And now to test it, I'm gonna just do another new email. I'm gonna send it to myself from the same account. And I'm gonna call it test rule disabled. This is a test. And I'm gonna go ahead and send it. 
So this should, if the rule was enabled, it would go into my training folder. However, since I disabled the rule, it's going into my inbox. Another feature that lends itself to efficiency and automation are using Quick Steps in Outlook. Quick Steps reside on the home tab of the ribbon. There's a whole gallery of Quick Steps. And there are some preset ones that come automatically with Outlook and you can create your own. And sometimes when you create a rule, it will create an accompanying Quick Step. So in order to see the preset quick steps, we're going to go to the right of the quick step gallery and we're going to do the diagonal arrow to open up the manage quick steps dialog box. So these are the ones that come by default. Well, this one is the first one here on my list is one because I had created that rule to move everything from training to the training folder. They're, the default ones that come with Outlook are to manager and some of them you actually have to edit them before you can use them for the first time. So the to manager one says that it's going to perform a forward on an email. So if you're on an email in your inbox and you click on the to manager quick step, it will forward it. It doesn't have a shortcut key assigned to it but it wants to forward the selected email to your manager. So you would have to edit that. So you could put in who to forward it to before you could use it. So you would have to put in your manager's email address. Once you do that and save it, you can then utilize it. If you have an email selected, it would be available to you up here and you could just click on it in order to get that message to forward. You have another one that comes out of the box. It creates a new email message to your team. Again, that one has to be um, configured a little bit so you can let it know who your team is. You can mark a message as done or as complete, right? And it can, so this one does three actions. It marks it complete, moves it to a folder and marks it as read. And then you have a reply and delete one. So it will reply to the sender and delete the original email. Now, I mentioned that you can create your own quick steps. So let's go down to the new button. And at the very bottom of that list, we're going to choose custom. And it gives it a name of my quick step. So that name will change depending on the actions that you choose. So it says add actions below that will be performed when this quick step is clicked on. So I'm going to do the drop down next to choose an action. And I'm going to choose move to folder. And then you have to choose a folder and I'm going to choose my training folder. Underneath that, I'm going to add another action. And this one on the drop down. I'm going to change the status of the message. I'm going to mark it as red. I'm going to add another action and choose an action drop down. And I am going to flag the message. And then I'm going to choose a flag for next week. Now you can assign a shortcut key. You have control shift one through nine if you want. I don't usually do that. I just reorganize and then click the ones that I use from the quick step gallery on the ribbon. And you can put in a tool tip, which is the text that will show if you hover over the item. So we will say moves email to training folder marks as red and flags for next week. And then I'm going to click finish. So this one I have, okay, this is the one that's at the top and I would want it to be at the top, but I'm going to go back over to the right and I'm going to edit it because I want the name of this to just be move to training and flag. That's what I want to name the quick step. And I'm going to save it again. 
So it's in the top position. Now, if I wanted to do a quick reply and delete, I might use that one more than others. So I'm gonna click on that on the left side and then I'm gonna use the up arrow to move it to the second position. And now I'm gonna click okay. So now I'm gonna send myself an email And the subject is going to be quick steps. And I'm just going to type, we are going to use a quick step we created. And I'm going to send the email. Now I'm going to select that quick steps email. And I'm gonna go up to my quick steps. I'm gonna hover over my move to training and flag quick step that we just created. You can see the screen tip moves email to training folder marks as red and flags for next week. So I'm gonna click on that. And now I'm gonna move over to my training folder my number didn't change because it marked the email as red, so it's not showing up as unread. And you can see the flag that's set on it, right, for next week. So pretty cool, real efficient feature to be able to use. So the quick step differs from a rule because again, when we set up the rule to move every message from training to the training folder, it automatically does that on all the emails that come in. The quick step gives you more control. Some emails that I receive from training, I want to move to the training folder, mark as read and flag the message. So quick steps are more message by message, whereas a rule can be more global. Now we're ready to begin our fourth and final module of this course, Advanced Outlook Settings. So this module will cover the tools that help organize your messages, manage your contacts, assign tasks, and schedule meetings and appointments on your calendar. It will also show you how to share and delegate your mailbox to coworkers. We have several learning outcomes in this module. By the end of it, you should be able to work with multiple calendars. You'll be able to import and export contacts. You'll have the ability to share and delegate access to other users, be able to create and assign tasks. Now we assigned a task earlier by dragging an email down to the task icon at the bottom of the folders pane. You're gonna learn other ways to assign tasks and you'll be able to back up your Outlook items at the end of this module. During this module, we will use the Outlook data file, it's named disney.pst, that you brought over from the video description earlier in the course. This module is broken down into five lessons. We'll begin by working with calendar settings, move on to managing contacts, then we'll get into managing activities by using tasks, sharing workspaces with others, and we'll end by managing Outlook data files. In lesson five, we're gonna set advanced calendar options, create and manage additional calendars, and manage meeting responses. Now, earlier in the course, when we went over global Outlook options, we went over some calendar options. I'd like to go back to File, and on the, almost at the bottom of the blue band, go to Options. And on the left side, click on Calendar again. Just a reminder, this is where you can set your work times. So, and we reviewed that, the area that is not shaded, it indicates your work hours on your calendar. If you need to change that or your days of the week, the first day of your week or the first week of your year, you can change all of that here under work time. I'm gonna change my default duration for new appointments and meetings to one hour instead of two hours. 
And I can also, let's see, we already added the holidays to our calendar and we'll revisit that in a moment. I'm going to go down under d display options and I'm going to change my calendar color. I think I like this orangey kind of color. And I'm going to not show my second time zone. If you created one earlier, you can uncheck it now. And remember, you don't want to swap them because if you swap them, the first one that shows on the list will be the one that it sets your system time to. And all the way at the bottom, it's automatically checked. You can show the weather on the calendar and change how you want to show the temperature. So we're going to click OK there. And I can see my coloration, that orangey color on my calendar now. And again, my work hours are unshaded. Anything outside of that is outside of work hours. And I just have the one time zone here on the left. Now, in the upper right hand corner, you have your view. You can change the view of your calendar from the ribbon or the upper right hand corner. I like looking at it in work week view. You can choose what view you like the best. I'm going to leave mine on work week and to the left of that, it's showing me Washington DC here. I'm going to go down to add location and I'm going to just type in Sacramento CA and press enter to search for it. And now it's showing me the weather for today, tomorrow, and the following day for that location. If I go back to Washington DC from the drop down, it's not showing me the weather and it should. You can add more locations here. Seems to only want to show it for Sacramento for me right now. Now on the left side, underneath your little mini calendars, you may or may not have all the sections that I have. I have several different calendars because I have several different email addresses tied into my Outlook account. So I have a calendar for my primary email address. I have a calendar for my training email address. And both of those email addresses have a birthdays calendar that it just gave me. When I initially downloaded my holidays, right, it gave them to my primary calendar. So United States holiday for my primary email account almost like a separate calendar. And then I downloaded the holidays again when I was in this account. So it downloaded them again. Now at this point, it downloaded it as a shared calendar. If I go and try to download the holidays again, it'll give me a warning that they've already been downloaded. So yours may have come across as a shared calendar as well. So how did I see the holidays on my calendar earlier? Right now, I'm on my calendar for this training email account. And if I go to my holidays calendar, if I check that one, it puts them side by side. Now I can overlay them. If I look at the right side, there's a left pointing arrow on its left edge and it says view and overlay mode. So I view and overlay mode. And then when I go to September 5th, I will see Labor Day. So anything that's on that holidays calendar shows up as green. Everything that's on my regular training calendar shows up as blue. And to make them go side by side again, I can use what's now the right pointing arrow on my holidays calendar. And they're side by side. And I choose to close my holidays calendar by using the X in its upper right hand corner. So you can view multiple calendars side by side. At some point, if you had like six or seven calendars, they'd just be skinny little panels and that doesn't look good. By using the overlay function is how you can do that. You can create other calendars in Outlook. Again, you get your holidays calendar, you get birthday calendars, you get calendars for every exchange email address that you have in your Outlook. And 
If you go to the Home tab of the ribbon in the Manage Calendars group, you can click on Open Calendar. So you can open a calendar from the address book, from a room list, if somebody's maintaining a list of calendars for different like conference rooms. You can open a calendar from an address book as long as you have permissions to that calendar. You can open a calendar from the internet, again, permission-based. If someone shares their calendar with you, you can open a shared calendar from here. You also have a shared calendar group that will be created on the left side. And you also have the ability to create a new blank calendar. So I use my Outlook calendars heavily, but I like to have a blank calendar that I can actually print out on a monthly basis just to keep on my pen board in my office so I can easily view it even when I'm not in Outlook. So I'm going to show you how to create a new blank calendar by clicking on that. And notice it's going to put it in your calendar folder underneath whatever email address you're in. And I'm going to name it blank. Yeah, I'm going to just name it blank. And I'm going to click OK. So now if I expand my calendars on the left, I will see the blank calendar. I'm going to select it, deselect my training calendar, and now I have a blank calendar. And I could do control P on it, right? And I decide I want the monthly style. And then I would go into print options. And I would say start it with, I'll go to August 1st through and I'll end with August 31st. And then I can preview it there and you'll see I'll get a blank monthly calendar for the month of August. I'm gonna do the back arrow at the top of the blue band to get back to my calendar. So now we're gonna create another calendar based on our Outlook address book. So we're gonna go back to our open calendar drop down on the ribbon. And this time we're going to choose from address book. So a couple of things here. I put some um, images, privacy blockers on my screen. And before I did that, I navigated to the contacts list for one of my email accounts. I already selected a contact from that list. I double clicked on the contact and just their name shows down here. Now this is going to be an example of you can add a calendar from your address book or from your contacts, even if you don't have permissions to that calendar and you'll see how that works. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK in the bottom and then You'll see that it opens on the right hand side of my screen and it says could not be updated because I don't have any permissions to that calendar. So I'm not going to be able to see or get any updates when Teresa adds entries to her calendar. I can, however, attempt to add something to this calendar. So I'm going to just double click on any appointment line and it lets me know that I don't have permissions. So that's what happens if you try to add a calendar that you don't have permissions to in your address book. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the X in the upper right hand corner of that calendar to close it. And notice it shows under my shared calendars group on the folder pane on the left. And I'm going to right click on that calendar, Teresa Connor Brown, and I'm going to delete it. It's useless for me to have it if I don't have permissions to it. So this time I went back to my open calendar from address book, put my privacy blockers back up, back in a contacts folder, and I already have a contact selected. 
And this contact is my other email. I already have permissions to this calendar. So you'll see the difference here. So I'm going to click OK at the bottom. So this one too opens on the right side. I can see the appointments and meetings that are scheduled on that person's calendar. And because of the permission levels that I have, I could even add things to that person's calendar. Now you'll learn more about permission levels in a later lesson. I'm going to just go ahead and close that untitled appointment window. I'm going to close that calendar on the right side. And I'm going to right click on it on the left hand pane and delete it. So now we're going to address how to manage meeting responses. To do so, I'm going to issue you a challenge. I want you to schedule a new meeting for 1 p.m. on the Wednesday next, whatever date you're on, the following Wednesday. And if you're able to, address it to your other email address. And for bonus, if you have two other email addresses that you can access, you're going to require both of those email addresses to attend the meeting. So I have my untitled meeting request open. I've addressed it to my two other email addresses and we're going to give it a title of schedule evaluation meetings. Going to just, I have mine set for a half an hour and that's fine from one to one thirty. And the location, I'm just going to type in conference room A. So you'll notice above your send button, it says you haven't sent this meeting invitation yet. Go ahead and click send. Once I click send, it puts the meeting on my calendar. So I switch back over to my mailbox. And you'll notice that I have one unread message in the inbox of each of my other two email addresses. I'm going to go to the top one and expand today. And I see that I get the meeting invite and I'm just going to select it. And in the reading pane, I'm going to go ahead and choose the accept icon and then just send the response now, meaning I don't have anything to say. And at this point, it disappears from the inbox. I'm going to go to my second inbox, expand today, select the invite. And in the reading pane for this one, I'm going to reply tentative. And again, I'm going to just send the response now. Now I'm going to go to my training inbox. I have two unread emails in there and you can see that I get the responses, individual responses to my meeting requests. Now, because all of these are accounts are in my name, they have the same name, but you can see that one accepted and one gave a tentative response. So now I'm back in my calendar. And this is the calendar, my training calendar. So I'm seeing the calendar from where I sent the invitation. And I'm going to warn you in advance, there is a little glitch in here. But I'm going to show you how to overcome it as well. So if I open that meeting invite that I sent, I'm going to just double click it to open it. Notice at the top, it gives me attendee responses. And this is where the glitch is. I have one accepted and one tentatively accepted, zero declined. So it should say one accepted, one tentatively accepted and zero declined, but it's not updating in here right now. I'm going to close that and I'm going to go back over to my inbox. Now I've never really relied on the original meeting invite tally at the top. I prefer, because think of it this way, let's say you sent the meeting invite to 20 people and 
They're all responding at different times on different days. I don't want to have to look through my all my emails to find the meeting responses. So there are a couple of things you can do. The most efficient thing to do is to create rules. And you've already learned how to do rules. So we're going to go back to the home tab. And I'm in the inbox for the sending account, the, the my training account. And I'm going to go to the rules drop down and go to manage rules and alerts. So in here, these are the rules that we created earlier that goes to the training folder and my one that's called Trish Connor Cato goes to the manager folder. Above those, I'm going to click on the new rule button and under stay organized, I'm going to select move messages with specific words in the subject to a folder. And then at the bottom, I'm going to click on the specific words link. And I am going to type the word tentative and I'm going to put a colon after it. Because that way, if somebody uses the word tentative in a subject, it won't be moved. Only the ones that have a colon afterwards, just like you see in the subject line in my inbox. And then I'm going to choose add on the right. I'm going to click OK. Now at the bottom, I'm going to, in the edit the rule description section, I'm going to click on the specified link to tell it which folder to move the email to. And so I'm on my inbox folder and over on the right, I'm going to select new. And I'm going to name this folder meeting responses and I'm going to click OK. So now it's got the meeting responses subfolder selected and I'm going to click on new again. And this one I'm going to just name tentative. And I'm going to click OK. And then OK again. So any email that comes in with tentative colon in the subject is going to be moved to the tentative folder. I'm going to click next, not going to have any conditions, not going to have any more actions, no exceptions. So I'm just clicking next until I get to the finish rules setup screen. And I'm going to check the box that says run this rule now on messages already in the inbox. And then I'm going to click finish. So now you can see, if you look at my folder pane on the left, I have a meeting responses subfolder with a tentative subfolder, and that has one message in it. So now what I'm going to have you do as a challenge is to create a new rule, put it into an accepted subfolder underneath your meeting responses folder, and run it on messages already in your inbox. And when you're done, you should have both the accepted and tentative folders under your meeting responses subfolder, and each of them should have the number one flag indicating one unread message. I'm going to go ahead and click OK on the Rules and Alerts dialog box. I'm back on my calendar, and I wanted to take a moment to go over some other meeting-related settings in Outlook. So let's bring up a new meeting screen. And I just want to point out that on the meeting tab of the ribbon, you have under attendees in the attendees group, I should say, you have response options. And my default set, my default setting is to let the system requests responses. So when we've been doing meetings and accepting them, we're not sending a response, but a user or an attendee could easily is allowed to send responses. What's not checked on mine is allow new time proposals. So in a potential attendee, 
they would be able to propose a new time for a meeting if that was enabled. And if that's something that you would want to do, you could set it here at the meeting level. I'm gonna just close that untitled meeting window and I'm gonna to go to the file tab and go down to options. And on options, on the left side, go to the mail setting. And you're gonna scroll almost all the way down to the bottom until you see the tracking section. So earlier in the course, I pointed out that you could always for globally request delivery and read receipts for messages in this tracking group. But there are two other settings in this group that pertain to meetings that I want to just let you know about. This automatically process meeting requests and responses to meeting requests and polls. So what it's supposed to do is it will automatically update the meeting on your calendar. Now you saw mine is kind of like glitchy when I went into the original meeting request and it didn't say anyone had accepted, only one had tentatively accepted. The second one that has to do with meetings is update tracking information and then delete responses that don't contain comments. Well, that would update the tracking information, meaning who replied, you know, to the meeting in the original meeting request. And then it would delete any responses from the inbox that don't contain comments. Now that part is actually very glitchy in 2021 outlook right now as well, because I'm still getting every response in my inbox, regardless of whether they don't contain comments. So just wanted to, maybe it'll work better on your system, but these are a little bit glitchy right now, as is the update on the actual meeting request in my calendar. I've reported them to Microsoft, these glitches that I've discovered in Outlook 2021, but maybe it's just a bad build on my system. So I'm gonna just cancel out of options. So lesson six in this module is managing contacts. And we'll be learning about that by covering how to import and export contacts, how to use electronic business cards, and how to forward contacts. Now, when it comes to using electronic business cards, you can use them for your contacts, or you can use, and or I should say, you can use an electronic business card as your email signature, and I'll show you how both ways are done. Now, in this lesson, we're gonna be using that Disney.pst file from the video description. And if you have a picture of yourself on your system, we can be using that as well. So before we get into importing and exporting contacts, I want you to locate a folder on your system and it's your documents folder. And within it, you have a subfolder called Outlook Files. So when you're importing and exporting from Outlook, that's typically the folder that it's going to be looking for. And I like to organize all of my Outlook files into that folder. So I have created subfolders within that folder, but you don't have to do that. I just need you to locate that folder. On the right side of my screen, I have a Windows Explorer window, and these are the files from the video description for this course. And that's where I put that Disney.pst, it's an Outlook data file. That's where I put that file from the video description. I also have a picture of myself in that folder. I'm going to select the Disney PST file, click and hold on it, and I'm going to just drag it over to my Outlook Files folder, and that will move it over there. That's where it should reside. Now, when you go to export and import, you can browse to different folders, but like I said, I like to keep everything in the Outlook Files subfolder underneath my Documents folder. So now I'm in my Training Contacts folder where we created contacts earlier in the course. And now we're gonna actually learn how to import 
contacts. So in order to do that, we have to go to the file tab on the ribbon and you'll see open and export. And then you'll see import export and you're going to click on that. So the wizard comes up and it says, choose an action to perform. And we want to import. So it's not a V card file. It's not a calendar file. It's giving you the extensions there. You can also import RSS feeds. That's not what we're looking for. So our only other choice is import from another program or file. Down in the description, it tells you such as Outlook data files, .pst and text files. So we're gonna choose next there. And we're gonna choose Outlook data file. And we're gonna do next. And now what you're gonna do is you're going to browse. And notice when you browse, it browses to that Outlook files directory underneath your documents. And so notice it even has the Disney file. It has an Outlook icon on it, and it tells you that it's an Outlook data file. We're gonna double click Disney. So we have the file selected, and then you have options. So let's say we had a Disney contact in our contacts list already. We could tell it, to replace any duplicates with items imported or allow duplicates to be created or do not import duplicates. None of that applies. We don't have any of the Disney contacts in here. So I leave it on the default option just in case I would replace the duplicates with what I'm importing. And I'm gonna choose next. So select the folder to import from so it's Outlook data file is what it's going to call it. It's going to include any subfolders and you can import items into the same folder. So I want it to be in my training folder and I'm going to do finish. And so now when I'm done with the import on the left side in my folder pane, I have a Disney folder and I have those four contacts that came in from that Disney folder. Now I will say none of these contacts have a picture. I wanted to put pictures of all of the Disney characters here, but they're copywritten by Disney, so I can't use their photos in here. If you open up Donald Duck, I'll show you one thing. This address is a real address and just some random knowledge to have. That zip code is a specific zip code that's only used for Disney World in Florida. So if I click on map it, it opens in my browser window and you can see that it's Walt Disney World Resort and it's marked on the map. I'm gonna go ahead and close my browser. Now I created a situation here that it's worth you knowing about. If you got any kind of error messages when you were trying to import the Disney file, when you look in your Outlook files directory, if it doesn't have an Outlook icon, that's a heads up to you. And it probably means that that file, when you copied it from the other folder, got marked as read only. Now this only happens occasionally, but it can be a real big stumbling block. If that happens, you would simply right click on the file and go to its properties and remove the read only attribute. And then you would start the import process again from your contacts folder. Just thought I would mention that because that can be a stumbling block. Now I'm back in my regular training contacts folder and I just have three contacts in here. Let's just play make believe for a little bit. Let's make believe we have 50 contacts in this folder. And these particular three contacts, they're part of our construction crew. And so typically when we email one of them, we're emailing all of them. If that's the case, you can set up a 
contact group. And we're going to do that by clicking the third button on the home tab of the ribbon, new contact group. And you have to give a contact group a name. So we're going to just call it construction. And then on the contact group tab of the ribbon in the members group, you're going to click on add members and select from Outlook contacts. So in here, I'm going to just double click on my first of the three contacts, do the same with the second and with the third. And I'm going to click OK. So now I have a construction contact group with three members in it. And by the way, before we get out of this group, before we save and close it, I'll just point out some other things. Let's say you saved and closed it and then you realize you needed to add somebody else. You can always open the group and click add members. Conversely, you can select a member and remove a member. You can also come in here and delete the group if necessary. We're going to click the first button, which is save and close. So now in our list of contacts, we have a construction group. And when I click on it, it's showing the members. Now I only have a photo in for Charles Connor. So the other members are being shown by their initials. So let's go over to our email and bring up a new email message. And I've addressed it to the name of my contact group construction. Now notice when I do that, there's a plus sign in front of construction. If I click the plus sign, it will show me the members and it will expand the group. So you're seeing the individual email addresses. You won't be able to collapse it again. You would have to delete those individual email addresses and then type in the name of the group again. So that way we're not going to actually send this email, but that way every member that's of that group will receive the same email under their group name because they're members of the same group. So now we're ready to export our contacts. I'm going to go to the file tab from my contacts folder, my training contacts, go back to open and export. And we're going to do import export again. And this time we only have two export choices. We're going to choose export to a file. And we're going to choose next. We want to export it to an Outlook data file as opposed to a CSV file. And we're going to do next. And then we get to select the folder to export from. So I'm under my training folder and I'm on just my contacts folder, not the Disney folder. And I'll actually collapse contacts. And I'm going to uncheck include subfolders because I don't want to include the Disney folder. And I'm going to do next. And so I'm going to browse again so I can give it a different name. It still has our imported file name there. So, well, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change it in that screen. I'm going to double click Disney and I'm going to type construction. So it will be a .pst outlook data file. Same options in terms of duplicates. And I'm going to simply click finish. Now you can add a password to this, which is optional so that anybody that you give the file to, or you would have to use the password to be able to open it. So we're not going to choose a password on this and we're going to just click okay. So go ahead and navigate to your Outlook files folder under documents, and you'll see that you now have a construction.pst file in that folder as well. Let's say that you just wanted to export your construction contact group. 
The way to do it would be to select it in your list. And then you're going to go to the file tab. And this has to be a save as operation. When we exported our contacts, it exported everything, including any contact groups that you have in that folder. So where it says file name, it gives it the name of the group. Save as type, it defaults to Outlook message format Unicode. We're going to do the drop down and choose text only. Now, the only way to do this is via save as, saving it as text only, and then you can bring it into another application like Excel as text data. So we're going to go ahead and choose, I'm going to just put this on my desktop. Yeah. And choose save. So now I'm going to go to my desktop and I see that I have that construction text file on my desktop. I'm going to use my taskbar and I'm going to launch Excel just to show you, just to play this out throughout the whole way. I'm going to just select a blank workbook. I'm going to go to the data tab on the ribbon. And in the get and transform data group, I'm going to choose from text slash CSV. And now I have to navigate to where I put that file on my desktop. There it is. I'm going to double click it. And you'll see it brings up the name of the file at the top, construction.txt. It shows the information in the file. And down at the bottom, I'm going to just click Load in Excel. And so you get this Queries pane on the right side. You can just close that. So this is how that data would come into Excel. You might have to clean it up a little bit, right? I might do something like copy the email addresses into another column or something like that. But that's the only way that you can get the contact group information out of your contacts list in Outlook, because when you export, it exports everything in your contacts list. And I'm going to just close Excel without saving the changes. Now we'll move on to how to use electronic business cards in Outlook. So I'm in my training contact folder and I'm going to open the contact for Charles Connor in my case. That's the contact that I gave a picture to that I added a picture that was on my computer to. So one of the things I wanted to say is you already have seen that when you create a contact, it automatically creates an electronic business card on the upper right hand side of the screen. And that business card will contain all of the information that you've put in for your contact. You can also edit the business card and that's what we're going to do now. On the contact tab of the ribbon in the options group, you're going to go ahead and select business card and it opens the edit business card dialog box. So on the upper left, it shows a snapshot of the business card as is. On the right side, you have card design. On the lower left, you have a list of the fields that are on the business card and the order that they're on there. And then on the right side of that, you have an edit area. So right now, the full name field is selected. And in the edit area, I could change the font, make it larger make it bold. Well, it's already going to be bold, italicize it, do all of those kind of things. On the right hand side, on the upper part of this dialog box in the card design area, I decide that I want the image to be on the right side of the card. So I'm going to do the layout drop down and choose image, right? I could also choose to give the business card a background color. I choose not to. You can if you'd like. I could change the image here if I need it to. I'm going to leave it the way it is. I can change the area of the image and I'm good with the area. And I'm good with the alignment of the image in the top left. 
Now in the fields list underneath, I would like to add a blank line after the email address. So in the list of fields, I'm gonna click on email and then I'm gonna do the add button underneath the field list and I'm gonna choose blank line. And you can see it change instantly on the business card. Now, if I have enough space, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna click in on business address and then I'm gonna add and see if I can get another blank line underneath that. And no, so that takes it off of the screen. So with that blank line under business address selected, I'm gonna remove it. And then at the bottom, I can click OK. Now, if you make a lot of changes in here and you decide, oh, the way it was originally was fine, you can always reset the card. We're gonna go ahead and click OK. And then we're gonna save and close this contact. Now I can also look at my contacts in business card view. And so I'm gonna just go up to the current view gallery on the ribbon and select business card view. And it's as simple as that. Now, typically when I'm creating my contacts, if I'm gonna do any editing of their business cards, I do it when I create it. Now I'll circle back around and show you how to use your contact card as an email signature after we cover this next topic, which is forwarding contacts. So I can be in pretty much any of the current views to forward my contacts. And I'm gonna just select one of my contacts here. And when I go on the home tab to the share group, I can go to forward contact and I get a choice. I can forward it as a business card or as an Outlook contact. We'll do both. This one, the first one I have selected, I will forward as a business card. And so it's creating a .vcf attachment. VCF is a standard format for contact files. And you see, since I selected business card, it's showing it as a business card. So I'm going to address this to my other email because this contact is in my training folder. And I'm going to go ahead and send it. So now I'm going to select the third contacts business card here in this view. And I'm gonna go to forward contact. And this time I'm gonna choose as an Outlook contact. So this time it comes up as an Outlook item. And that's fine. You'll see both flavors from when I get them in my inbox for my other email. So this one I'm gonna also address to my other email. And I'm going to click send. And so I'm in my inbox where I forwarded those two contacts to, and I'm on the Charles Connor email. And you'll notice it doesn't have the forward in the subject line, the FW colon, like it does in the one above it. When you forward a business card, it doesn't indicate that it's a forward. And it does an attachment, which is that VCF file format. And when I do the drop down next to the attachment and I choose open, it actually opens as a contact. Now, if I wanted to retain this contact in my contact list, I would save and close it. And you can go ahead and do that. And it's the same process other than it says forward in the subject line for my Richard Johnson contact, which we sent as an Outlook item. And so I can do the drop down next to the attachment. I can open it. And again, it opens as a contact. It gives me a read only up here, 
but I can save and close it and then it will be in Trish's contact list. You can go ahead and save and close that one as well. I switch back to my contacts folder and I'd like to show you Trisha's contacts, but I have too many confidential contacts in there to be able to put it on screen for you. But I do have Charles Connor and Richard Johnson in both lists at this point. So now I'm going to show you how to use an electronic business card as your email signature. The first thing that you're going to do is create a contact for yourself. Now I've already done this. I'm going to challenge you to do it. I will open mine as guidance for you. I added a picture that was on my system. Mine is a combination of real and bogus information. The address and phone number are, are bogus. And I edited the business card so it's not showing the address on it. And you'll notice I have a blank line after my name and another blank line after my email address. So you're gonna wanna make your business card look similar to mine or whatever suits your needs, but you need to create a contact for yourself. And once you're done doing that, you're gonna go ahead and save and close your contact. Now we're gonna set it up so that our email signature will be our electronic business card. We're gonna go to the file tab and almost at the bottom on the left, you're gonna go to options. In Outlook options on the left, you're gonna click on mail. And over on the right, you're gonna click on the signatures button. So the first thing I'm gonna do is rename my default signature from default, so it's selected, and I'm gonna click the rename button, and I'm gonna name it text. So it's a text signature. And then you notice it updates, I don't have default anymore, so it updates that it's gonna use that one on new messages, unless I tell it different. Now we're gonna create a new signature. Now, if we hadn't created that contact card and we use this signature and we went to business card, it would only put the text that's in this box on the business card. So we're gonna select new and we're gonna call this one business card. And we're gonna click okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down to the text area and click in it and it should wipe out all the text that was in there. And on the right side, well, above the text box in the edit signature area, you're gonna click on business card. And at the top, I've navigated to the appropriate contacts folder and I'm gonna select myself in the list. I can see my business card preview at the bottom and I am going to click OK. And now I'm gonna tell it to use my business card as my default. So over on the top right, well actually I'm gonna save first. On the top left, I'm gonna save. And then on the top right where it says new messages, I'm gonna do the drop down and select business card. And then I'm gonna click OK and OK again. And now I'm gonna switch over to my inbox. I'm gonna bring up a new email and you'll notice that my business card is in there as my email signature. Now let's say for this email, and it also gives it in there as an attachment, my business card. If I wanted to use my text signature, Right on the message tab, I can go to my signature dropdown and choose text and I can switch back and forth from here. So when you have multiple signatures, you can switch between them at the message level, but you can only have one set as a default. And we're not going to send this email, just wanted to show you how it comes up. So I'm gonna close this email without saving the changes. Our seventh lesson 
is managing activities by using tasks. I'm not going to show a PowerPoint slide because we only have one topic in this and it's called assign and manage tasks. So I'm going to go to the bottom of my folders pane and I'm going to select my task list. So just as a reminder from our earlier lesson involving tasks, your to-do list on the left side is anything that has a due date. So it could be a message that you flagged or a task that you have a due date on. And then you have your task list per email account. I'm gonna go to my task list. And on my task list, I have two tasks. And there's one that I assigned to Trish earlier in this course to my other email. And when I did that, I said, keep an updated copy on my task list. So it's on my task list. And it's also on Trish's task list. I'm going to go back to my training task list. So I have another task on here that wasn't assigned to anybody. It's, you notice the icon here, when a task is assigned to someone, it has a little person icon on the clipboard. And when it's not, it doesn't. So this make sure printer has proposal by Tuesday task. I can look over here and see that it's overdue based on where I am now. So what I can do is if I click the check mark in front of it, it marks it as complete. So maybe I forgot to mark it as complete on the day that it was supposed to be completed, but I've marked it as complete now. And I'm gonna open it up by double clicking it. And so you can just see the details in here and the status is now completed, All right? So I can go ahead and save and close that one. Now I'm gonna go back to my Trish task list and I'm going to mark the assigning this to Trish task as complete. And when I go back to my training task list, it's also marked as complete. Now we're gonna create a task that we are going to own. We're not gonna assign it to someone else. So I'm just going to do, I'm in my training task list and I'm going to do control and the letter N to bring up an untitled task window. I could have clicked the new task button on the home tab of the ribbon. And the subject of this one is going to be check team availability for evaluation meetings. And I'm going to give it a start date of the next Monday, wherever you are in your calendar. So I've already done some work on this one and the status is not started. I'm going to change that to in progress. And I'm going to say that I completed about 25% of the task. So I'm going to just type that in the percent complete. And now I'm going to save and close it. Now it's in my task list. And if I wanted to give a status update on that task to a colleague, I can. And the way to do that is to open the task by double clicking it. And then you'll notice on the task tab of the ribbon in the manage task group, there's send status report. We're gonna select that and I'm gonna address it to my other email, my Trish email. And you'll see what Trish will receive, the original task, right? The start date, the due date, the status, percent complete. And it was requested by training, but it's training's task. This is not assigning a task. The subject line is task status report. And I'm gonna go ahead and send that. And then I'm going to save and close my task. And I just want to show you something as a process step. So go ahead and bring up another 
task window, another untitled task window. And when you're creating an untitled task, even before you save and close it, you have the option of sending a status report. But if you click that button right now, it's empty because you never saved the task. So I'm going to close this empty status report email and not save the changes. And I'm going to close that untitled task. So the process step is you would have to save and close the task, reopen it, and then send a status report. That's the, uh, the way it works. Just wanted to point that out. So now I'm going to give you another challenge. I'm going to have you reopen your check team availability for evaluation meetings task, update the percent complete. Don't make it a hundred percent, whatever percentage you choose above 25% and send another status report about that task. So now I'm in my Trish inbox. And I see my first task status report. This is when it was 25%. And then the one that I just challenged you to do is another status report. And I set it at 50%. So now that I've marked that task 50% complete and I sent an updated status report, something has come up and I'm not going to be able to finish that task. So I'm going to open my check team availability task again. And this time in the manage task group on the ribbon, I'm going to choose assign task. And I'm going to address it to my other self. And I'm going to keep an updated copy of this task on my task list and get a status report when the task is marked complete. I'm also going to put a note at the bottom saying I need to hand this off to you. If you can complete by Tuesday, that would be fantastic. Since it's kind of last minute in my case, the task is due tomorrow. So I'm just putting that in there as a note and I'm going to go ahead and send. So you'll notice I get the one flag next to my Trish task list. And there's the task that's been assigned to me. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click the task. And I'm going to accept it because it's really an invitation. So I'm going to accept it and just send a response now. It's still on Trish's task list and I'm going to double click and open it up again. And this time I'm going to just go ahead and mark it as complete. And I'm just going to do that from the ribbon. And it marks it as complete and it closes it. And now I'm back in my training task list and you see it's also marked as complete there. Now in my training inbox, because I had send me a status report when the task is completed, you'll see both of the tasks that were assigned, one that we did earlier in the course and the one that we just did are in my inbox with a status report. So I can click on both of those just to mark them red. So I was notified in my inbox when the tasks were marked complete. Now, some other things that you can do in your task list, you know, your mark completes, they will just stay here. Everything that's mark completed. If you want, you can use this remove from list button on the ribbon to remove a completed task or any task from the list. I can also right click on a task and have some options from that menu as well. Now, when I'm in my task list, it's going into what's known as the simple list view. 
Let's take a look at the detailed view. Just shows a couple of more columns. We can go to the prioritized view. And so you have different groupings, normal, right? Three items, one unread. My unread flag didn't disappear from my training task folder yet, but I don't have any unread tasks in there. And then it has none, three items that one is unread. So it's showing as both normal and having no flag. And then another list is active tasks. I have no active tasks because they're all been marked completed. And then I have completed view that I can look at. If you do the bottom arrow on the right of the current view group, the more button, you'll see that you have a today view. So tasks that are due today, the next seven days, overdue tasks, tasks that you've assigned, and then server tasks. Lesson eight is sharing workspaces with others. In this lesson, we're gonna learn how to delegate access to Outlook folders, how to share your calendar, and how to share your contacts. So to delegate access to Outlook folders, you can determine which folders you want to grant access to, as well as the permission levels that they will have. So let's go to our file tab on the ribbon. And it didn't matter whether you're in your inbox or your task list or wherever you may be. On the file tab, you're gonna click on the account settings button and I'm gonna go to delegate access. Now up here, I'm making sure I'm in my training account. And then I'm gonna click on delegate access. It lets you know that delegates can send items on your behalf, including creating and responding to meeting requests. If you wanna grant folder permissions without giving send on behalf of permissions, close this dialog box, right click the folder, click change sharing permissions, and then change the options on the permissions tab. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is on the right side, you're gonna go ahead and click add and you're gonna select your other email address. And once you select your other email address, you'll get the delegate permissions and then the name of that person dialog box. And it says this delegate has the following permissions. By default, it gives editor permissions to calendar and task, no permissions to inbox contacts or notes. So for the calendar, it says the editor can read, create, and modify items. And you have an optional checkbox there that's checked. Delegate receives copies of meeting related requests sent to me. Now, if I click next to the drop down next to editor, you can see the different permission levels, reviewer, author and editor and what kinds of levels of permissions they get. And then there's also none. We're gonna leave it on editor and we'll leave that checkbox checked. I don't need my assistant, my mythical assistant here to have access to my task list. So I'm gonna do the drop down and do none. For my inbox, I'm gonna give them editor permissions and I'm gonna leave contacts and notes also as none. And then at the bottom, you have two check boxes. Automatically send a message to delegate summarizing these permissions. That's a kind of a nicety. And delegate can see my private items. So sometimes you might mark an item particularly on your calendar as private, it's up to you whether your delegate can see those private items. I'm not gonna check that one. I'm gonna just click okay at the bottom. And then at the bottom of the delegates page, there's three option buttons. Deliver meeting requests addressed to me and responses to meeting requests where I am the organizer too my delegates only, but send a copy of meeting requests and responses to me, my delegates only, and my delegates and me. Well, if this is gonna be my assistant, I'm gonna just say my delegates only. 
and I'm going to click OK at the bottom. And I'm going to use the back arrow to get back into my inbox. So now I see the email that Trish received letting her know that she's a delegate and what her permissions are. And it also gives further instructions to open folders for which you have permissions, click file and then open and then other users folder. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to file, open and export there. And then there's other users folder. And I can just type in the name, right? And I can go, so this would be my training folk. This would be training. And then I could click OK. So because I have access to all of these email addresses, it's not going to create another training email for me here. But that's the process that you would go through. Now, there was something else when we went to assign a delegate that I want to address. I gave my delegate, and I'm going to just go back to my training email. I gave my delegate access to my inbox, and they can send on behalf of. So it said in there, if you want to change the permissions, you have to change them at the folder level. So if I right click, on my training at trishtraining.com email address in my folders pane, and I go to folder permissions from there, you can see that Trish Connor Cato, this is the Trish, I put them in here, and I gave them all full permissions, right? And so if I needed to change their permissions, I could change them from in here. And I could say maybe they can't delete any of my items, something like that. So it changes it up here to custom. I'm not going to change anything there. I'm going to just put it back on editor. And then I'm going to just cancel out of there. So that's kind of how that delegate process works. So if I'm Trish and I've received that email authorizing me as a delegate, when I go to my calendar, I would just go up on the ribbon to open calendar where we've been before from address book. And I would select my training email address. And because of my permission levels, you'll see on the left side, it shows up under shared calendars here. And if I no longer wanted it to show there, I could right click on it under shared calendars and I can delete the calendar. So I'm no longer seeing it. Now, in addition to assigning a delegate, you can just simply share your calendar a couple of different ways with other people. So one way I like to share my calendar and I'll give you a scenario for this. You don't want to make everybody a delegate. It's only if you have like an assistant or a colleague that's going to handle your work while you're out of the office or something like that. But you can share your calendar if, let's say you're trying to schedule a meeting with somebody and you've been going back and forth and you can't find an available date. What I may do at this point, and I can even do this with people outside of my organization, I might email my calendar. So first I'm going to switch back to my training calendar and on the ribbon on the home tab of the ribbon in the share group, I like to email my calendar and you can control what the recipient sees. So I'm going to click on email calendar. And the first thing that happens is send a calendar via email dialog box opens where you can specify the calendar information you want to include. So the calendar is my training calendar. I'm going to give it a date range of the next seven days. And I'm going to just select availability only the default detail section. And time will only be shown as free, busy, tentative, working elsewhere or out of the office. If you look at the other choices, you have limited details. 
It would include the availability and the subjects of calendar items only. Or full details would include the availability and full details of your calendar items. I typically just show availability for this scenario. And then I'm also going to check the box underneath availability only that says show time within my working hours only. There's an advanced section that says show and nothing happens there. It's just the email layout, daily schedule, or list of events. I'm going to hide that. And I'm going to click OK at the bottom. So, and we don't have to send this email. I just want to change it from which address it's coming from. But I would address it to Trish, right? But I'm not going to actually send it. You can see right in the body of the email what the person would see. So it's training calendar, my calendar. The date range that's showing is listed there. Has my time zone. And then it shows the dates on a little mini calendar that are accommodated there. It gives a legend, so the recipient will know what the icons mean. And so it's seven days. I'm actually recording this on a Sunday, so it's including that day, right? It's outside of working hours. Monday lets me know that I'm busy from 9 to 10, but I'm free my other working hours. Tuesday, so on and so forth, right? So I'm sending them the next seven days. That's what they would get if I click send. I'm going to just close that email. Another way that you can share your calendar if you haven't delegated it, you can go to share calendar in that share group on the home tab. And then you get to address it. So it composes an email address, right, from training. I'm going to address it to Trish, even though she has delegate permission. And when I'm sharing my calendar, it by default checks a box under the subject line, allow recipient to view your calendar. And you can control how much they're able to view, availability only, limited details or full details. I'm going to leave it on availability only this time. And then what I'm going to do is also under the subject line, there's another checkbox. I can at the same time request permission to view a recipient's calendar. I'm not going to do that with this one, but you could. And then they have the option of accepting that request when they receive your request. I'm just going to go ahead and click send on this. It confirms that I'm sharing this calendar with Trish and that the permissions are availability only. And I'm going to select yes on the confirmation. So now I'm going to switch back to the inbox. And I'm in Trisha's inbox and I see my sharing invitation for trainings calendar. So when I select that, it says training has invited you to view their calendar. Click the open button above. So I can click open. And when I click open this calendar, it takes me back to my calendar and now my training calendar is under shared calendars. So it will remain there unless I delete it. So as a delegate, you're going to open it. If you are going to share it with someone that you're not making a develop, uh, delegate, they can get it under their shared calendars as well. And once you share a calendar, either by sharing it or delegating access to it, you can click in that share group, you can click on calendar permissions. And you'll see that that training calendar is shared. This is the delegate one that's an editor. And then I have a custom one in here where they only get to read the free and busy time. I can always change some of these settings from in here if necessary. I'm going to just cancel out of there. 
So sharing your contacts is very similar to sharing your calendar. As a matter of fact, it's so similar that I'm going to start get you started and then I'm going to have you complete the process on your own. So on I'm in my contacts list for my training contacts list. On the home tab of the ribbon, you're going to in the share group, click on share contacts. And look how similar this is to sharing your calendar. So you get to address it. You can request permission to view their contacts folder, allow recipient to view your contacts folder is the default. So go ahead and address and send this message. And once you get that done, to get to your shared contacts in that same share group, you would open shared contacts, navigate to that folder. So I already have both of my folders here that I'm using. So if I didn't, if I just had one, then I would get my other one when I did it. So you share your contacts and then you can open those that have been shared with you from this button. Our last lesson in this advanced portion of Outlook 2021 is managing Outlook data files. We'll be learning about how to manage your Outlook data files by covering how to use archiving to manage mailbox size, how to back up Outlook items, and how to change your data file settings. Before we get into archiving in order to manage our mailbox size, let's take a look at some global archive settings. So we're gonna just click on the file tab and go to options. And on the left side, we're gonna click on advanced. And you have your auto archive area right there. And we're gonna click on auto archive settings. So we can tell it to automatically do this however many days, right? If I check the box that says run auto archive every 14 days or every seven days, you can have it prompt you before it runs. And then during auto archive, it would delete any expired emails in expired email and email folders only. It would also archive and delete, archive or delete old items. So these are check boxes here. You might want it to just delete expired items when it archives or expired and archive or delete old items. Now under archive and delete old items, you can have it show the archive folder in your folder list and your default folder settings for archive would be clean out items older than whatever time period. For mine, I'm gonna change it to three months, clean out items older than three months. And then it tells it where to move old items to. And if I click in that text box and click end, right? It's gonna move it to that Outlook files directory and it's gonna name it archive.pst. If you wanna move it to a different directory, you would do browse. Or you can tell it these are option buttons to permanently delete those old items. I'm going to keep them in a file for a while. So I'm not going to select those choice, that choice. And then I'm going to select apply these settings to all folders now. And then at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. So it would auto archive for me every 14 days, I will be prompted or whatever time period you put in before it does that process. And then it would create that archive folder. It sends it to your Outlook files directory and you could also open it or import it back into Outlook if you wanna get those emails back into your Outlook. So that's one way of doing it by going to your advanced Outlook option and going and fixing your auto archive settings. We're gonna click okay to get out of there. Now I'm gonna do this on my Trish inbox cause I have older emails. 
At this point, I'm on my Trish inbox. And this time I'm going to go to file. And if I look at mailbox settings, this is another place where I can see the size and how much free space I have, but I'm going to click on tools and I'm going to go to mailbox cleanup. So you can click this button to view your mailbox size again. You can tell it to find all items that are older than however many days or items larger than however many kilobytes. If I click auto archive, it's going to go by those settings. So click the auto archive button for a moment, right? And it goes by those settings that we set globally. So if I go back to my mailbox now, notice I have another group here in my folder pane called archives, and I'm going to expand it. And if I look in my list there, I have archives, I can expand it and I can click once on inbox and you'll see everything that was archived. And also if I look at my outlook files folder under documents, I'll see that it created archive.pst, which could be imported in if I want to get those files back into the appropriate inboxes. Another thing that you can do is you can simply back up Outlook items. So I'm going to click on my training email inbox. And I'm simply going to go to the file tab and I'm going to go to open and export again. And this time I'm going to choose import export again. And we're going to choose export to a file. And next, we're going to do an outlook data file and next. And so I get to select the folder that I want to export from. So I want to export my entire training inbox, which is selected. And I'm going to include the subfolders with that. And I'm going to choose next. And so I'm going to change this file name. I'm going to double click on construction there and I'm going to call it training inbox. And I have my options for duplicates and I'm going to just simply click finish at the bottom. Now we're not going to do a password here, so I'm going to just click okay. So when I go and look at my Outlook files folder, I have my training inbox.pst. So the entire inbox versus what I archived out of the other inbox. So the entire one is just a backup and that's an export operation. So why would I do that? Well, if I had a critical failure and something happened, I could import this and get all my emails back. So our last topic here is how to change or access your data file settings. So let's go to the file tab on the ribbon and I'm going to make sure I'm in, it doesn't really matter which account I'm in here, but I'm in my training account and I'm going to go to the account settings drop down list and click on account settings. So I'll see all of my accounts that I have. And then at the top, I have several tabs. I'm going to go to the data files tab. And this is showing so that new archives folder that was created when we archived our items. I have some SharePoint lists in here and I have my three accounts. Now my personal account, if I click on that one, and I go to settings button above the accounts. So when I do that, that is a non Microsoft exchange account, right? So when I click on that, it gives me the ability to compact that outlook data file to reduce the size. And I'm going to just cancel out of there. I don't want to do that. 
If I click on my training email account and then go to settings, because these are exchange accounts, it opens up the Microsoft Exchange box. I have a general tab, can't change anything there. I have an advanced tab. I can check and uncheck some boxes, but really can't change much in here. These files are created when you add your emails into Outlook. And then I have a security tab here, which is dimmed out. Can't change anything. Now this could be because admin has set this and I just don't have access to it. But I don't think that's really an admin setting. Uh, it's just a default setting that it won't let me change. And so these are your data files. Now I'm going to just cancel and get out of this box. And with my training data file selected, notice that it's giving me a file location that's not that location we've been using when we've been exporting or importing data into Outlook. It's in an app data folder. Now, if I wanted to see it, I could just click on this and open the file location and it takes me into that. So some of these, I have multiples in here. Don't worry about it. But some of these have an extension. You can't see it in this one. This one, you can see the .pst. I'm going to just close that folder. When I hover over this one, you'll notice at the end of the screen tip, it's saying .ost. So my email addresses are .ost. And that's a a file that can be accessed whether you're online or offline. So if I turn off my Wi-Fi, I can still compose an email. I can still send it. It will hold it in my outbox. And then when I have an online connection again, it will send it for me. And then it goes to send items. So that's a offline kind of data type there. So you really, the only thing you can really do here, you can't really change many of the settings. You can set a particular email address as a default. My Trish one is my default email address. I can remove email addresses from here. So we're going to just go ahead and close that. Thank you so much for attending this Outlook 2021 video course. By way of review of what was covered in this course, we had a total of four modules that we went through. The first two modules were in the introductory portion of the course, and the last two modules were in the advanced portion of the course. In module one, we covered the basics of Outlook, and that's where you learn to navigate Outlook create and format email messages, attach items and files to emails, and track your messages. The learning outcomes for that module were that by the end of it, you'd be more efficient when managing your mailbox. You can modify settings within Outlook. You can attach files in an email, and you're able to track, recall, and resend messages. The second module was about managing Outlook. And this is where you were introduced to the tools that help you organize your messages, manage your contacts, and schedule meetings and appointments on your calendar. By the end of that module, you were able to create folders, categories, and mark messages. You were able to add and edit contacts. You gained the ability to schedule appointments, events, and meetings and you were able to save notes and create tasks associated with an email. In module three, we focused on automating Outlook. So you learned more advanced settings within Outlook, and you learned about the search functionality and how to automate repetitive tasks. So by the end of that module, you learned how to group, sort, filter, and search for messages. You learned how to modify settings within Outlook. You gained the ability to create automated replies. And you also learned how to create rules to simplify repetitive tasks. We also created quick steps for more automation in that module. 
And in our final module, Advanced Outlook Settings, we did a deeper dive into the tools that help organize your messages, manage your contacts, assign tasks, and schedule meetings and appointments on your calendar. You also learned how to share and delegate your mailbox and other Outlook folders to coworkers. So you learned how to work with multiple calendars, creating them, right? You also learned how to import and export contacts. You learned how to delegate access to folders and how to share items, Outlook items with other users. You were able to create and assign tasks and you learned some more task stuff that we didn't cover previously. And we ended by you learning how to back up your Outlook items, as well as how to change your auto archive settings and auto archive items. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.